to this industry presented webinar, Exercise as Medicine for Cancer. A few housekeeping announcements before we get started. After viewing this presentation, you will have the opportunity to take a short survey where you can also post a question for the presenter and complete a 15 question self-test for your CEC. Upon successfully passing the self-test, you will receive a CEC certificate via email awarding your CEC and your CEC will automatically be added to your ACSM profile. Today's webinar is presented by Technogym. For over 30 years, Technogym has been committed to promoting wellness, a lifestyle based on regular physical activity, a balanced diet, and a positive mental attitude. With over 2,000 employees, half of whom are based at headquarters in Cecina, and 14 branches in Europe, USA, Asia, Middle East, Australia, and South America. Technogym currently exports 90% of its production to over 100 countries and has equipped more than 65,000 wellness facilities and over 100,000 private homes throughout the world. The company's core offering is the Technogym ecosystem, an ecosystem made up of cardio, strength training, and functional equipment, together with the networking platform and a full range of services. All market sectors benefit from such a solution, from private customers at home to hotels, beauty farms and spas, as well as rehabilitation centers, fitness clubs, corporate gyms, and gym facilities that are part of universities, schools, and military organizations. Today's webinar presenter is Professor Robert Newton. Dr. Newton is a professor of exercise medicine at Edith Cowan University, Perth, Western Australia. In 2020, he was appointed as a Vice Chancellor Professorial Research Fellow in the Exercise Medicine Research Institute. In 2019, he was named the Western Australia Premier Scientist of the Year, and in 2018, Professor Newton received the Career Achievement Award from the Cancer Council Western Australia. Professor Newton has published over 800 scientific papers, including 400 referred scientific journal articles, 450 conference abstracts and papers, three books, 16 book chapters, and has a current Scopus H index of 75, with his work being cited over 19,000 times. As of 2020, Professor Newton has attracted over $38 million in competitive research funding. It is with great pleasure that we present to you Professor Robert Newton. Welcome to this presentation on exercise as medicine for cancer. My name is Robert Newton, and I am Professor of Exercise Medicine at Edith Cowan University in Perth, Western Australia. I would like to sincerely thank the American College of Sports Medicine and Technogym for providing me with this opportunity to present to you today. So, exercise as a medicine. It is a term which is being increasingly used in allied health and medical care. It is the physical assessment and prescription of exercise specifically for the prevention or treatment of injury or illness. Now, whilst many would not see exercise as medicine, I believe there is strong rationale that it is in fact an actual medicine. And the reason why is that it drives endogenous medicine, driving and stimulating the body to produce its own medicine internally. And these include a whole range of hormones and cytokines, but also an enormous immune system responses as well. And so very much the exercise is causing uh, the release of this medicine from, our, if you like, our internal pharmacy. And similar to uh, exogenous uh, pharmaceuticals, then uh, it is switching different pathways off and on and producing considerable changes within the body's uh, internal, internal biochemistry. But exercise as a medicine does far more than this because it has the capacity to drive direct structural adaptation and repair. It influences blood perfusion and vascular adaptations. But it also facilitates other therapies and ameliorates side effects. This uh, figure is uh, from Kerry Cornier's group published uh, in 2007. And I think it summarises very nicely the application of exercise medicine across the cancer continuum from pre-diagnosis where we know that being physically active is important to reduce your risk of getting many cancers. But then at this point of diagnosis here, application as a pre-treatment, so if you like neoadjuvant, in other words a treatment which is provided prior to the main treatment. 
And a lot of research and clinical practice showing that this is an important time to prescribe exercise medicine. As one example, a prehabilitation, if you like, leading up to surgery to remove the cancer. And here, uh, exercise is very important for increasing the resilience of the patient, perhaps uh, make their body composition more healthy, increase muscle mass, reduce fat mass. And the evidence is quite um, convincing now that this improves the actual uh, surgical procedure, reduced uh, post-surgical complications, a whole range of benefits. It, uh, exercise then can be actually applied during treatment, for, uh, during chemotherapy or radiation therapy or some new work coming out applying it during uh, immunotherapy. And uh, the key reason here is that it appears to reduce the treatment side effects. So all treatments, all cancer treatments, will have some level of toxicity. They will produce some uh, negative effects in the patient, and these can be quite uh, concerning. But uh, exercise has been demonstrated in uh, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, to actually reduce many of these uh, side effects. There's also emerging evidence that will actually increase the treatment effectiveness, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. And then we have, if you like, the uh, post-treatment phase here, and uh, I guess looking at exercise as a rehabilitative uh, therapy to help the patient recover from their chemotherapy or their surgery, radiation therapy, to regain uh, physical capacity and fitness, but also improve their body composition, and also disease prevention here, such that it... Uh, reduces their risk during this phase of developing further chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes. Many cancer treatments actually greatly increase risk of uh, other um, chronic diseases. So this is an important uh, application of exercise medicine here to try and reduce that risk. It's also been demonstrated that being physically active will reduce risk of recurrence of the original cancer. And this is very top of mind for any uh, cancer survivor, will this come back? And uh, exercise again, critical there to reduce that risk of recurrence. And finally, we see exercise as a medicine uh, in patients which can no longer be cured of their cancer. So uh, they are in a palliative stage and uh, exercise, most importantly, I think for the maintenance or uh, the slowing of the declines in quality of life. And this, again, very important, keeping the patient as uh, physically able uh, as possible to maintain quality of life. And increasingly, we're seeing exercise used here with the potential to actually extend survival. And we again, we'll revisit this later in the presentation. This is a, quite a nice uh, perspective, uh, analysis of prospective cohort studies and looking at post-diagnosis exercise and cancer-specific mortality, uh, published by Friedenreich and others in 2016. And uh, again, this is one of many um, meta-analyses that have been completed, and they all come to pretty much the same conclusion. Some key points here. This is the plot of the various studies and the effect estimate here, uh, with the uh, breast cancer being the predominant number of studies, then colorectal and prostate and this being the overall here. A couple of points to note. Uh, here is one, meaning that there's no benefit, but there's also no disadvantage of exercising. And the first thing to note is there is not a single study reported here which actually has a detrimental effect. In other words, there is no study reported here that actually uh, increases cancer-specific mortality risk. Now, this is highly consistent. There. Uh, across the last couple of decades, what we're seeing is that exercise, physical activity, is quite safe for cancer patients. And uh, I guess this is uh, important because there's, there's uh, not so much now, but certainly 10 to 20 years ago, there was concerns amongst clinicians and patients that exercise would actually exacerbate their disease, that it would make it worse uh, or would bring on uh, metastases and, uh, uh, and worse morbidity and mortality. But this really hasn't been borne out in the scientific um, research. 
What we see here is varying levels of risk reduction. So across all of these studies, what we observe or what the authors reported was a 37% overall reduction in risk of cancer specific mortality comparing the most versus the least active patients. So a pooled relative risk of 0.63. So this is quite an astounding outcome that exercise, physical activity, is actually improving survival in cancer patients. Now my colleagues and I published a paper in 2016 in Nature Reviews Urology where we put forward a series of uh, 10 potential mechanisms by which exercise actually influences tumour biology and increases survival and uh, we'll go into some of these in more detail uh, as we go through the presentation but a range of factors in particular myokine and adipokine uh, profile changes in these cytokines improved immune function some hormonal factors here as well certainly reduced systemic inflammation changes in tumour vascularization modulation of gene expression and epigenetic modulation telomere alteration and also modulation of circulating factors uh, for example insulin uh, growth factors and various sex uh, steroid hormones which have a strong influence on uh, tumor biology uh, with sedentary behavior uh, causing a change in profile which is cancer promoting whilst exercise actually changes these uh, circulating factors to be uh, cancer inhibiting. So let's have a look at a few examples. The first a very nice uh, model here, the exercise synergy with radiation therapy. Now many patients with cancer will receive radiation therapy and uh, the way in which this works is that the, the site of the tumour is uh, irradiated and the radiation causes direct damage to the DNA within the cells. Now because cancer cells are dividing much more rapidly and when they're in a uh, dividing phase they're much more vulnerable to DNA damage from the radiation. So the result is that radiation therapy uh, tends to uh, destroy more cancer cells than it does healthy cells. But there is a, a second effect which is termed the oxygen enhancement effect. Uh, of radiotherapy. Now with this the radiation causes water ionization and destabilization leading to the formation of reactive radical species. Now these react with neighboring molecules to yield reactive oxygen species. Now these are most cytotoxic and they attack the DNA and cause damage. However this DNA uh, radical damage is readily reversible. DNA will repair. In the presence of oxygen however the DNA damage can be stabilized and this is termed the oxygen enhancing effect of radiotherapy. The problem is that with tumors they are usually uh, have poor perfusion. They, as they develop because they're growing quite rapidly the microcirculation does not develop normally and so the tumour will have poor blood flow and this results in low levels of oxygen or hypoxia. So the, this uh, development uh, impedes very much the oxygen enhancement effect. What is particularly uh, exciting about the use of exercise uh, during the course of radiation therapy is that Acutely, it increases blood perfusion across tumours. Now, as many of you will know, when we exercise, the body redistributes blood considerably. It uh, uh, prioritises uh, blood to the working muscles. And uh, other uh, organ systems have greatly reduced blood flow, for example, the digestive system. What's interesting is that tumour arterioles lack this exercise-induced vasoconstriction. Plus, you have the increased blood pressure that occurs when we, when we do any form of physical activity or movement. So the result is that acute exercise greatly increases blood perfusion, actually within the tumour, and this has been demonstrated in numerous animal models. So, greater blood flow, more oxygen, 
greater oxygen av availability within the tumour, the oxygen enhancement effect for radiation therapy will be greater, greater death of uh, cancer cells. But chronic exercise has been demonstrated to normalise blood vessel structure within tumours. So uh, as the cancer develops, if the person is physically active, then the blood vessel structure within the tumour is more normal. And so this again contributes to better blood flow, higher oxygenation. There's also a, a whole range of other reasons why this is important because the, uh, the poor vascularization favors cancer cells and is a problem for normal cells. So uh, cancer cells rely on uh, anaerobic metabolism, glycolysis, and uh, they do much better in a uh, hypoxic, a low oxygen environment whereas normal cells uh, don't. And so this, this favours the development of cancer cells. The other aspect to this is with a poorly developed um, vascular structure within the tumour, uh, the blood vessels themselves tend to be leaky. And it is more, and this also, due to the low levels of oxygen and a, a whole lot of uh, um, effects going on there, the cancer cells are more likely to metastasize. They're more likely to leak out of the, uh, the main, the primary side of the tumor uh, into the uh, systemic circulation and then uh, develop in other sites in the body. And of course, this is a, uh, a major uh, issue and, and contributes to much higher mortality with, those, the, with these patients. So what is the take home message from this? Well, Cancer patients must exercise chronically at all stages of cancer treatment to try and uh, maintain the best possible um, uh, circulation, microcirculation within the tumour and to in ensure that it has high blood flow and good oxygenation. Now, also, we are currently recommending that cancer patients exercise immediately prior to radiation therapy. And we have commenced a randomised control trial where we have the patients exercising for 10 minutes or so immediately before they go into the uh, linear accelerator to receive their radiation therapy. Now, there are uh, many such studies uh, examining survival and the body composition of the patients in, in different cancers. And I just draw on this uh, particular study here. And what they, uh, in this particular study, this was uh, patients with uh, metastatic breast cancer and they followed them over many years, up to 10 years post the initial uh, CT scan. And this is the actual survivorship uh, function estimate here. Interestingly, these two curves separated quite quickly with the sarcopenic patients versus those patients that were not sarcopenic. So muscle mass appears to be very important in terms of survival. Radio density was also analysed. So radio density is a reflection of the quality of the muscle. Again, we see rapid separation of the survival curves here. Those patients with low radio density, in other words, poor muscle quality, uh, they have a, a much lower survivor function estimate. Certainly, adiposity was significant. Uh, here we have the three tertiles or thirds in terms of adiposity. The, the, uh, the uh, highest third of uh, adiposity certainly had a, a much poorer survival estimate. So the results of this, uh, median follow-up of six years, there was around 619 deaths among the 3,000-some patients. 34% sarcopenia, 37% had low muscle radio density. Interestingly, sarcopenia, there was a 41% greater risk of dying. And this was an increased risk regardless of the level of adiposity. An increased muscle volume of one standard deviation resulted in a 10 to 13% reduction in risk of dying. So muscle mass appears very, very important in terms of cancer survivorship. The highest third out of uh, adiposity compared the lowest 35% greater risk of dying. Now, uh, these were metastatic patients uh, here, but we've seen similar reports for uh, patients in stage two to three breast cancer as well. So take home message from this, body composition assessment should be routine for cancer patients, in particular to highlight those patients that are sarcopenic. Resistance exercise and nutritional supplementation and possibly caloric restriction for overweight patients must be incorporated into 
cancer patient care. So the enhancement of treatment efficacy really depends on two key factors. First, successful targeting, delivery of the drug or radiation to the tumour or residual tumour cells. But also the tumour must be sensitive to the cytotoxic impact of the treatment. Exercise increases oxygen delivery to the tumour, both acutely and chronically. It increases immune cell infiltration and enhances drug delivery. So these factors are very, very important and again emphasise the importance of both acute and chronic exercise throughout the phase of cancer treatment. So several animal studies have alluded to the exercise enhancement effects in, on chemotherapy. Now there's a range of mechanisms that we can spe speculate around. They probably include enhanced distribution uh, of the drug throughout the body so it is uh, more effective at uh, scavenging and destroying circulating tumour cells. Uh, it enhances the immunological recognition of the dying tumour cell so if you like uh, improving the, the body's innate immune system to recognise uh, tumour cells and uh, destroy them. And induction of memory immune cells. This could add to future protection against recurrent uh, circulating tumour cells and nodules. So this is a very nice summary uh, figure and this was from Lee Jones's group published Nature Reviews Cancer in 2017 and I won't go into it in uh, extensive detail but I just want to get across the point that exercise is really regulating the tumour microenvironment and we have when in sedentary individuals here and, and that during rest then the, the environment or the milieu as it's called uh, is one in which you have high metabolic uh, hormones such as insulin, glucose, IGF-1, high, se high sex steroids such as estrogen, high levels of inflammation, IL-6, C-reactive protein and high autonomic dysfunction. These characteristics are highly tumour promoting. It creates an environment um, within, systemically within the body which actually helps the tumour to survive and grow. Now when you do acute exercise, your respiration, cardiac output, glucose output, etc., free fatty acid release goes up. Also tumour perfusion, O2 delivery, catecholamines go up. Hypoxia comes down, so greater oxygenation into the tumour. And the shear stress, so in other words the, the forces on the, the blood vessels also increases. Now this has quite an inhibitory effect as shown in, uh, in red here. Now with repeated bouts of exercise you have physiological adaptation and it resets the physiological set point. And we have a huge interaction between fat tissue and muscle tissue, heart, liver, bone, all interacting with long-term exercise here to change the homeostatic control circuits and really alter the systemic environment. And again, this creates in a fit and trained individual here where we have low levels of insulin, glucose and IGF-1, low levels of sex steroids such as estrogen, less inflammation and less autonomic dysfunction. And basically a resolution also of immune homeostasis. Now this, with chronic exercise, is again quite suppressive of uh, tumour development. So the overall result in terms of the tumour microenvironment is that you have reduced uh, PI3K signalling, lactate and MCT1 and these are uh, compounds which tend to cause, uh, molecules which tend to cause cell growth and proliferation and they're, they're reducing in the, in the exercising uh, acutely and chronically individual. You have changes in immune regulation, increased T cell content, very very important, increased natural killer cell infiltration, very very powerful uh, immune cell for uh, attacking and destroying cancer cells and decreased uh, TAM uh, which are tumour associated macrophages, decreased accumulation, again very positive in terms of immune regulation. And finally within the tumour microenvironment angiogenesis is occurring here with uh, producing decreased hypoxia, increased vessel maturity, increased pericyte coverage, uh, all resulting in quite significant uh, suppression of tumour development in particular 
the um, metastatic uh, process as well. So this is a, a very nice model. Again, this is from Lee Jones's group, and it's describing the therapeutic window. And it's very nice because it, it really encapsulates the, the two effects that exercise has. It shifts the treatment efficacy left. So if we look at treatment efficacy here, this is the um, response versus the treatment dose here. It shifts, shifts the treatment efficacy to the left meaning that uh, at a, uh, a lower treatment dose, you have higher response. But it also shifts the treatment toxicity to the right, because we know that exercise reduces um, therapy uh, toxicities. And so the result is it increases the size of the therapeutic window. Just to draw this together in, in terms of the acute and chronic effects, so this is a, a paper from the uh, Denmark group, uh, led by Pernille Hoyman. And it describes very nicely the acute dosing, if you like, of exercise medicine. Because each time you perform an exercise bout, you get spikes in exercise factors, uh, which reduce tumor growth and cancer risk uh, from acute exercise. And if you like, this is like taking the dose of medicine, and these myokines and catecholamines uh, spike up and then recover for rest and spike up in concentration with each exercise bout. And that's, that's, that's beneficial. It's, it's very similar to um, regularly taking a, uh, a, a pill, a, a pharmaceutical drug, where you take it perhaps once per day. But you also have the training adaptations as well, which decrease the risk factors. And uh, some of these may be dependent on fat loss. And this reduces, again, tumor growth and cancer risk in the long term. Because uh, with chronic training, as fitness improves here, we see that insulin comes down, sex hormones and inflammatory markers are reduced, giving the chronic effect of exercise. I want to move on and just dig into some details and uh, just some, uh, in particular, around the different effects of exercise and uh, just some of the nuances of it. And the first one I want to talk about is the interference effect. And many of you will be familiar uh, from your basic physiology that uh, resistance training can be interfered with by aerobic training and vice versa. And for most of us, this is not a problem because we have intact immune systems and we're relatively healthy. It is a problem in elite athletes, of course, and elite strength athletes you know, really try to avoid uh, any aerobic exercise because it will compromise their, their strength and muscle mass. This is interesting because this was a study that we published in, uh, we presented at the American Society for Clinical Oncology meeting in 2014. And uh, what we showed here uh, in a, in a, uh, a six-month intervention that uh, we had three groups, and I'll just talk you through it. Uh, the three groups were a delayed group, so they just received usual care, uh, an aerobic and resistance training group, and then we had an impact loading and resistance training group. The impact loading was implemented to try and um, prevent the bone loss that occurs in men undergoing androgen deprivation therapy for their prostate cancer. I point out that the resistance training was identical between these two groups. But if we look at the changes in muscle strength here over this, leg, over this time period, we see that there's a significant difference between the group that didn't do the aerobic exercise. They did the same resistance training here, but the, aerobic, the group that did the aerobic exercise as well had lower increases in strength. And it could be this interference effect that's occurring. You might say that, well, the impact loading uh, produced further increases in strength, but it's unlikely. It was very low volume, uh, and uh, it's unlikely that that contributed to strength. And this is probably borne out and when we look at the, uh, the changes in whole body lean mass because we've got a significant difference here between the aerobic and resistance training group and the impact loading and resistance training group, a marked difference in terms of the accumulation of uh, lean mass. And uh, we hypothesized in this that this is due to the fact that this group was doing the additional aerobic exercise, and this was compromising uh, their increase in muscle mass and strength. Now, 
uh, these men, remember, they have prostate cancer, they're receiving, uh, they're castrate, they're receiving pharmaceutical castration, no access to testosterone at all. So it appears that uh, we have to be very careful in our exercise prescription because uh, the nuances that we don't see in normal healthy people certainly may be more apparent in, uh, in cancer patients and in particular undergoing certain treatments. This is a, a paper published in 2018. Again, it was from uh, Lee Jones, uh, Professor Lee Jones at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. And it was uh, comparing the, uh, looking at the feasibility, safety and efficacy of aerobic training in uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer. And uh, there's a whole lot of very nice results that come out of this, but I've just pulled this particular figure out because it's interesting to compare uh, across the weeks the planned treatment versus the actual completed uh, treatment here. And what they report is quite a marked difference. And so there's a couple of points to take out of this. The first one is that we have to really start reporting correctly in exercise trials with cancer patients what was actually done uh, rather than just report how many sessions they attended. But the second thing is that this, with this group uh, obviously they have advanced cancer and the uh, the reality is that whilst a certain exercise prescription was planned, the uh, actual completion of it was much, much lower. And, uh, and this is something to consider. And it was clear that certain patients, in particular, if you have a look at this diagram here, there is a vast difference between patients as to what they can actually tolerate in terms of dosage. And we see a number of patients down here that could tolerate and complete less than 50% of the prescribed exercise. This is a, a study from our own work. This is in patients with high-grade glioma, and these patients are receiving chemo radiation. Uh, it was supervised. It was in an exercise clinic, so you know it had the best chances of having reasonable compliance. But it comes back to what the patient capacity is, and we see here quite a marked um, disparity or, or spread in terms of response. Uh, and these are the, the numbers above the bars are the actual patient numbers. And we see that certain patients, patient 20 here, we see actually declined markedly in leg strength over the course of the three-month intervention. And that same patient we see here in repeated chair rise here, number 20, shows no benefit at all, no improvement. Look at timed walk, this same patient here actually got markedly slower in the timed 400-metre walk, 6-metre walk both usual and fast pace. So some patients will, despite the exercise, they will decline in performance and, uh, simply because their health is declining. They're undergoing, in this case, chemo radiation. It's impacting their health and the exercise uh, may be pr producing benefit. But if you look at just the pre-post results in individual patients, we see that they're actually not improving and in fact getting worse. It doesn't indicate that the exercise is compromising. Uh, their capacity or health, it's just that it cannot overcome the declining health due to their treatment or disease. Which brings us to the uh, exercise dose reporting. I just want to make the point that this is very, very important and uh, both in research but also in clinical management is to very closely monitor what the patients are actually doing. And this was a paper we published in Medicine, Science, Sport and Exercise in 2020. And uh, we went to a thorough analysis of uh, several of our trials and looking at what was the planned exercise versus completed. Now these patients were some um, less advanced cancers than uh, what was in the Lee Jones study and also in that uh, high grade gliomas paper I just showed you. But uh, still we see a considerable difference between the planned and the completed. And then we look at training volume over the various session numbers here and we see that on, on no session do they actually meet the, uh, the planned training volume um, either as well. So uh, now what we're proposing is that uh, for aerobic training, it, it must actually report the not only the uh, whether they actually did the session, but also the duration and intensity of the session. For resistance training, it needs to be reported the training volume uh, as sets by reps by uh, the number of exercises. It needs to be fully reported. Mode. Uh, this is one that uh, is an interesting one because, look, it's important that all patients, uh, cancer patients, move, and they should avoid being sedentary. And in fact, the, the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines are that uh, all cancer patients should avoid being sedentary, and they should exercise on most, if not every day of the week, regardless of cancer type, 
stage or even when receiving, receiving difficult treatments. But we do have to be careful about what sort of exercise and what dosage. As you've, we've just shown that, uh, you know, you, you, it's, the dosage also probably has to be tailored to individual patients and where they're at. This was a study that we published in Medicine, Science and Sport and Exercise in 2018. And it's coming back to that uh, previous study I just I showed you earlier, where we had the delayed exercise, the combination of aerobic and resistance training, and then the impact loading and resistance training. And this was over six months in the darker bar and 12 months in the lighter bar. And this is uh, lumbar spine, bone mineral density and femoral neck. Now what's interesting is that there was no difference at six or 12 months between usual care and a, an aerobic, fairly intense aerobic and resistance training program. Now you would conclude from that that exercise doesn't help when it comes to bone loss in men with uh, prostate cancer on androgen deprivation therapy, but that's not the case. The situation is that it was just the wrong medicine, that is the wrong exercise medicine. It was only the combination of impact loading and resistance training that produced significant, um, significantly less bone loss both at 6 and 12 months. So the take home point from this is exercise is not a single medicine. It is many different types of uh, medicine and the mode and also the dosage has uh, quite large impact on the overall outcome for the patient. Now, uh, several years ago, we were approached by our uh, collaborating clinicians because they were concerned about cancer patients with more advanced disease and in particular those with bone metastases. So here, this is stage four cancer where it has left the primary site uh, and has metastasized to other tissues, in this case into the skeleton. And the recommendation at the time was that these patients should avoid exercise, in particular they should avoid resistance training, for fear that they might spontaneously fracture. But the clinicians were reporting that these patients were doing very poorly and that was there a way perhaps that we could exercise them. Now there was no studies at this time where uh, in a, in a uh, research setting where cancer patients with bone metastases were being exercised. So we developed a uh, randomized control trial here uh, with 57 patients randomly assigned to exercise or usual care and then we exercised them over a three month period. They had bone metastases at various sites throughout their body, pelvis, femur, etc. as you can see and that's, that is um, determined based on what's called a PET scan, positron emission um, scan here uh, to determine where these hot spots or uh, bone metastases are. Now what we came up with was a highly specialised exercise prescription tailored to the individual patient and we, we borrowed this from the um, high performance uh, athlete research. Uh, and uh, professional practice. Now, if an athlete injures themselves on, in a game on a Saturday, uh, we don't uh, give them six weeks off. If they uh, tear a hamstring, we just hamstring. We just exercise the other leg and the rest of the body, and that's that's routine in 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 uh, sport. So we thought, well, can we apply this to uh, metastatic cancer? And we came up with, with what we call the three, M3 EP uh, program. So multimodal modular exercise prescription for prostate cancer. And with this, we determine from the PET scan, well, the report tells us where the bone metastasis site is. And then we adjust the exercise mode for both aerobic and resistance exercise, depending on those sites. So for example, if the bone metastasis site is in the pelvis, then they can do upper uh, body and trunk resistance exercise. Now they can do lower body but we would exclude uh, hip extension and flexion but include knee extension and flexion. The aerobic exercise they wouldn't be able to do weight bearing but we would do non weight bearing aerobic exercise such as uh, stationary cycling and then they can also do the flexibility. So this is how the exercise prescription was designed based on metastatic site. Now the big question was, at this time, was this safe? I mean, could they actually do it? The other one was, would, it, would they respond? These are patients 
that have advanced cancer, stage four, and they've received a lot of treatment, and many of them are quite unwell, can they actually respond to an exercise program at all? Well, the first off is they will do it. Uh, they completed uh, 32 out of the 36 possible sessions, so 89% attendance. It's safe. There was no exercise-related adverse events or skeletal fractures. Could they work at an appropriate uh, intensity? Well, yeah, they could. It was about 12 or 13 um, on the 6 to 20 point Borg scale of re um, rating of perceived exertion. They found it tolerable. There was no change in pain whatsoever and no change in pain medication. So it appears safe. It appears uh, feasible for these patients to exercise. But can they actually respond? Do they get benefit? Well, here just, here's just some of the data from this paper. Well, what we found was a considerable improvement, significant improvement in physical functioning. And also, that's self-reported, but physical performance, particularly leg strength, increased quite markedly, um, comparing the baseline to three months here. So they can still retain, even with advanced disease, the ability to respond to a, an appropriate tailored exercise prescription. Well, this was quite encouraging and led us to um, another study, this again in men with advanced metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And the protocol paper was published in BMG Open, uh, BMJ Open, sorry, in 2018. And uh, I can refer you to that for more details on this study. And this is a study, it's an international multi-site trial, uh, randomised. It uh, was funded, or is funded by the Movember Foundation for some $10 million. And we have two randomised arms, self-directed uh, exercise arm here with 433 patients as the target recruitment. And basically we just provided the printed exercise recommendations from ACSM. And then we have psychosocial support around regular newsletters. The exercise arm receives exercise, behavioral support, but also psychological support. And the exercise program involves 96 weeks of supervised exercise, transitioning to self-managed exercise. We're using moderate to vigorous exercise and it's a step as well as a structured resistance exercise program. Now these men have advanced prostate cancer. They are quite unwell. They have received, uh, most likely had surgery to remove their prostate. They have received androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, many will receive, have received chemotherapy and they're now receiving advanced uh, super anti-androgens. The primary outcome here is overall survival. Now this is important because to this point, there is no study in a randomized control trial which has demonstrated exercise to increase survival in cancer patients. We have lots of studies which have uh, tracked uh, patients over time and looked at their survival, but you have the problem of reverse causality. We don't know whether patients who exercise live longer because of the exercise, or do patients that feel better and do better actually exercise more? And uh, it really requires a randomized control trial such as this to prove causality. Now we're looking at a primary outcome of uh, survival. Uh, the median outcome in the control group is expected to be around 35 months. And we've powered the study for a median survival in the exercise group of 44.6 months, an overall hazard ratio of 0.78. We've got lots of secondary outcomes around time to disease progression, time to first symptomatic skeletal related event, etc. And where, as well, we are looking at a lot of biomarkers to get an understanding of how, uh, the, if there is a survival advantage, how biologically is it being produced. The exercise prescription is quite sophisticated and advanced. It's tailored um, specifically to ameliorate the issues causing the greatest morbidity and mortality. It's mixed mode, depending on capacity and priority. It's periodized. It oscillates within the week, the month, and across the quarter. It's fairly high intensity, RPE of about four to seven on a 10 point scale. It consists of both moderate and high intensity interval training. Resistance training is six to 15 RM with large muscle groups, functional movements. It's auto-regulated. What this means is that when the patient comes to an exercise session, we uh, have a questionnaire asking them how they feel. If they're feeling quite uh, sharp and well with not much fatigue, we'll, we'll increase the intensity of that particular session and possibly the volume. 
If they are feeling unwell or tired or they have pain, then we will reduce the intensity and volume. We may even cancel the entire session. So this is auto-regulation. Again, it is borrowed from high-performance sport um, practice. We use the same thing with athletes. If they're fatigued from the weekend games or from, from training, then we adjust the volume, intensity, and type of exercise that they'll do at a particular session. There is also nutritional support here around uh, protein supplementation in this study. So this is an ongoing study. Uh, our target is around 900 patients recruited internationally. And uh, at the moment, we have around 100 and, uh, 140 patients randomized to this trial. So in both of these studies that I've mentioned, we have avoided loading the site of the bone metastatic um, lesion. However, there is animal research showing that if the site is actually undergoing some level of loading, it actually suppresses the tumour progression. So this is just one study in a human metastatic breast cancer model in, uh, in animals. And uh, what they showed in, uh, in the tibia here, where they had unloaded versus uh, loaded here, we see at six weeks, the loaded still has 100% uh, tibial integrity, whereas the uh, non-loaded, only around 30% of the animal's uh, percentage still have an intact tibia. Uh, similarly with the tumour growth, we see the percent of tumour-bearing uh, animals here uh, loaded here, it's only around 20%, where the non-loaded is 100%. So something seems to be going on here where the actual loading of the bone is suppressing the development of the tumour. And uh, it's, it's greatly reducing this. Uh, it's probably related to both chemical and electrical signalling between the bone cells and the tumour cells. So this is quite interesting and encouraging. And so our team has launched on two studies, uh, one in prostate cancer and one in breast cancer. And what we're using is controlled isometric muscle contractions to provide controlled loading at the uh, site of the bone metastases. You can see the program here with the patients training on Monday through to Friday. Now they're doing our M3 EP program where we uh, do resistance and aerobic exercise, not loading the site. But they are also, every day, also performing SIT, which stands for um, Static Isometric Training. And with this, we're doing graded exercises with using bone pain as our measure as to whether we can advance or we need to uh, reduce the intensity. And we're using that to see if we can actually provide controlled loading. In this case, it is to the spine. And uh, we are using some quite advanced MRI techniques because we're also looking to see if it suppresses the rate of growth of the, of the, uh, the cancer as well. As long as, of course, look, as, as, as well as looking at uh, safety and effectiveness in terms of physical function, quality of life, etc. So those studies have uh, been completed and we're just um, analysing the results now. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, present more of that to you and, and produce the papers in the near future. In 2009, my colleagues and I published the Australian Position Statement on Exercise and Cancer. And uh, at that time, based on the available evidence, we uh, stated that patients should be active on most, if not every day, and uh, that they should uh, try and accumulate 175 to 150 minutes of aerobic exercise each week and two or more resistance training sessions. Now, in 2019, we published an update uh, to this uh, statement in the Journal of Science and Medicine in Sport. And the purpose was to uh, integrate uh, the huge amount of research that had been completed over the subsequent decade. One of the major changes in terms of our recommendation uh, contained within our 2019 uh, statement is that we really have to move towards a tailored exercise prescription for cancer patients. And this involves a, a process by which the patient is assessed and then determining and prioritising the health issues that, are, that they face. Identifying their patient, the patient's capacity and intervention suitability and then designing the exercise prescription. So we're really encouraging uh, clinicians to move away from a generic exercise um, program uh, uh, to just give generic recommendations or you know try to walk more now 
any physical activity will be better than none, but certainly we can be much more optimal in terms of our exercise prescription. And then this needs to inform the mode, intensity, frequency, duration. We need to have progression in the program as well, and then frequent reassessment and prescription modification for the patient. Now this prioritising exercise prescription is very, very important. Now for very relatively healthy patients that are perhaps post-treatment, they're not undergoing great difficulty, they don't have any serious comorbidities or chronic disease risks, then certainly they can receive a, a, a program which is more about general health and fitness. But for patients which are uh, perhaps have uh, bone metastases or they're under, they are experiencing considerable treatment toxicities and difficulties. Patients who have high risk of other chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, then really we have to target in on the morbidity and mortality which is most likely to cause either death or difficulty for the patient. And then other aspects of the exercise prescription are much more secondary. This needs to be combined, of course, with patient goals, their access to facilities and, and their finance capability to pay for different interventions as well. The, the patient is the centre of all this. They have to be in control. They have to be uh, the, uh, the main um, decision maker about their own health. So that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, and then considerations of treatment enhancement become the, the next priority here. Can this exercise actually improve radiation, chemo or immunotherapy effectiveness? And then this general health and fitness, as I say, is, is, the, is the, uh, the lowest priority, uh, uh, the last priority that we actually consider. Now this throws up all sorts of um, issues. Uh, certainly, uh, if, we, if we look at here, then uh, you know, the patient might just prefer to walk. Oh, look, I just want to walk at home. Uh, that's, that's all I want to do. But if they have severe sarcopenia, that's probably not going to be great for them. And it's certainly not going to provide any benefit in terms of addressing that. And so, yeah, I mean, chemotherapy is not easy. Uh, it's not enjoyable. For the same token that, you know, the exercise prescription may actually uh, require a certain amount of effort and commitment, both in time and financially. Um, and also, you know, may not be that usually pleasant. Uh, high intensity interval training is not pleasant. But if the patient, uh, you know, has concern, you know, there's concerns around metabolic syndrome, for example, this is probably going to be the best medicine to turn that around, along with uh, high intensity resistance training. So. The foundation exercise prescription guidelines which we presented in our paper, it, it, in, in the main it should be multimodal. Most patients should receive a combination of aerobic and resistance training. However, the emphasis should be according to the priority issues that you've identified. And taking into account there could be potential interference between aerobic and resistance exercise which we've talked about previously. It needs to be moderate to high in intensity. Frequency and duration, most days you should spread the dosage over as much of the week as possible. It's the same as taking pharmaceutical drugs. You don't take all of your tablets for the week on a Saturday. It's, it's to be spread over the week. So you're constantly dosing the system to maintain the concentration of these, uh, these exercise medicines. And you need to uh, um, have progression here, maintaining the same relative intensity. We also uh, recommend in our statement that the program should be periodized. We need variation across the week, month, and month uh, and even over three months and again we're drawing on the extensive amount of research which has been done in high performance athletes astronauts soldiers uh, as to you know this variation reduces boredom it reduces injury risk but it also enhances the physiological adaptation and we also periodize around at certain events a good example is chemotherapy if you know that chemotherapy is coming up in three weeks, you can gradually increase the, um, the, the uh, intensity of exercise leading up to that event, as even though it, 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 analogous to if you were preparing for a sporting event, uh, you know, an important game or competition. But after the chemotherapy, you will have to drop back in intensity and certainly drop back in volume uh, because they will, for, will have this fatigue and uh, other issues for the, for the uh, starting about two days post and continuing for up to a week after the chemotherapy infusion. And I come back, we're also recommending this auto-regulation, which I've already discussed um, in previous slides. 
So that's the um, uh, overall recommendation. The aerobic exercise uh, should be moderate intensity continuous. We also are recommending high intensity interval training for certain patients. Uh, it, it has been demonstrated in a wide range of studies to be safe and effective. I think we're finding it particularly helpful in patients with a lot of um, cancer-related fatigue. They don't tolerate moderate intensity continuous training very well at all. It's, uh, they find it much easier to do short bursts of high intensity um, aerobic training. Relatively high intensity here. Duration probably needs to be around 20 minutes per session per day as a minimum, but for low functioning patients that can be spread uh, doing 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. Uh, as, as an example, however it works best for them. And also with cancer patients, you really need to work in with their diurnal rhythms. Uh, again, there is the generic prescription of accumulating 75 to 150 minutes per week, but this will vary vastly depending on the condition uh, and health of the patient. But certainly we know for fat loss, they probably still need to accumulate around 300 minutes or more of aerobic exercise per week for fat loss. And um, we've just completed a study in uh, obese men with prostate cancer, and this is pretty, we've demonstrated some nice uh, reductions in fat mass, but it did require a large volume of aerobic exercise to achieve that, along with um, nutritional caloric restriction. Resistance exercise, it probably needs in most cases to be dynamic, although we are using isometric exercises uh, in patients with metastatic um, disease, as I've mentioned. A combination of concentric and eccentric. The weight needs to be relatively heavy, around 6 to 12 repetition max, but stopping 1 to 2 repetitions short of neuromuscular failure. Uh, normal uh, exercise recommendations, of course, apply 48 hours at least recovery for a given muscle group. It needs to be large muscle groups, nice functional movements, minimum of two sessions per week. Uh, if you go to three or more sessions, then you, you're going to have to split the program uh, in terms of uh, which muscle groups and exercises are prescribed. Uh, for muscle hypertrophy, it's likely to be a higher volume load, sets by reps um, by load, but it all depends on the initial condition and training background of the, uh, of the patient. If they if they're totally, have been totally sedentary and have been doing no resistance training, they'll still respond with hypertrophy, most patients, uh, but it, the, once they start to adapt, the volume will probably have to increase to continue to stimulate muscle growth. And also, there might have to be some specific targeting of muscle groups impacted by treatment, uh, for example, uh, through surgery or radiation therapy. Now, in our paper, we also discuss acute or chronic cancer-related concerns requiring specific exercise prescription consideration. Again, it's coming back to this very important point that the exercise prescription should be tailored to the individual patient. Now, for example, cachexia. Now, this is a, a rapid loss of body mass, both muscle and fat and bone. And so we need a, a very specific training program for here. Certainly, resistance training is absolutely critical. And uh, it may be that an emphasis on eccentric, on the eccentric phase, uh, might be important as well, because eccentric training uh, has a lower energy requirement, but has a, a still retains a quite good hypertrophic drive. It might be important to limit aerobic exercise in patients with cachexia. They already have an energy imbalance, so doing a lot of aerobic exercise only makes this worse. So telling a patient with cachexia to get out and walk as their predominant exercise is probably counterproductive. They're also going to need nutritional support, and uh, we recommend protein, uh, perhaps even additional energy, and potentially creatine monohydrate supplementation as well, and we're doing several uh, studies examining that. Uh, another example might be bone loss. If a patient has uh, developing osteopenia and osteoporosis, it's very common in men with uh, undergoing ADT for prostate cancer, also women on various hormone uh, treatments as well. And so they, they require resistance training. They would also need that impact loading that I described earlier and potentially nutritional support around calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Now, Around uh, two-thirds of the population in the US and also in Australia and many other countries of the world are overweight or obese. So that's reflected in the cancer population. And this is a major problem because as we discussed in a previous slide, high fat mass and low muscle mass is very uh, cancer-promoting. It creates an environment which actually um, encourages 
um, tumor development and cancer cell proliferation. So this is a problem. We need to get maintain or increase muscle mass, but we also need to reduce fat mass. So this, as you know, requires high volume aerobic training, probably 300 minutes or more per week. We have to do resistance training with these patients because any uh, in particular, if we're doing nutritional support around caloric restriction, reducing their actual energy intake, then it's not just a fat loss program, but it's also going to be a muscle and bone loss program. And so they must do resistance training to counteract uh, the uh, potential risk of uh, muscle and bone loss. So these are just some examples. There's a lot of other examples uh, in, our, in our paper, and I refer to that paper, which is available for free download from the website. Now, something we uh, also note in our position statement from 2019 is that we must be cognizant of the presence of other chronic diseases. Now, for example, uh, cardiovascular disease is very, very common in uh, the pop general population, but in particular those with cancer, uh, because a lot of the treatments actually exacerbate cardiovascular disease risk. So we need to reduce body fat, increase cardiorespiratory efficiency, normalize blood lipid, glucose profile, lower blood pressure, uh, nutrition, an anti-inflammatory diet, and ameliorate the treatment side effects, for example, statins. Now this is important because depending on treatment-related side effects as well as other patient considerations, it is possible that the signs, symptoms and side effects associated with a patient's chronic disease or risk of chronic disease may supersede cancer. Uh, as a priority of the exercise prescription. So if, as an example, the patient has advanced cardiovascular disease, that needs to be the priority because that is going to cause the greatest morbidity and, and mortality. And treatment of the cancer through exercise may well be secondary concern. Now, I just want to talk about the absolute contraindications to exercise and recommend the ACSM guidelines regarding this. And uh, I present them here. I won't go through them all. Uh, most cancer patients will not have any of these absolute contraindications. If they do, if a patient does have any of these, then they should not be exercising. They, uh, they need uh, for a physician, their medical team, to actually address uh, these absolute contraindications first. If, however, which will be the vast majority of cancer patients, even those with advanced disease, they are good to go. They are able to perform some form of exercise. It all depends on the setting and the level of supervision. So we have three factors or uh, components that come in here, the patient, the setting, and the supervision. So here we have the patient ranging from post-treatment, apparently healthy, through moderate risk, they have acute or chronic cancer related concerns or relative contraindications, or those patients who are high risk, they have absolute contraindications and um, are palliative. The setting here, the lowest level uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of setting, in terms of safety if you like, or um, the highest level of risk is exercising in the local park or in the home community centre, fitness centre, an exercise clinic, and then the highest level of control is within a hospital. For supervision, the lowest level uh, is self-managed or support through a lifestyle instructor or educator, a fitness professional, allied health, and what we call in Australia an accredited exercise physiologist or in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in the North America, it's a, a clinical exercise physiologist or an allied health professional such as a physiotherapist or a physical therapist that has exercise physiology training. And then the highest level of supervision is an accredited exercise physiologist with specialised oncology training or an actual exercise uh, physician. So these three components into play. So for a patient who has relative contraindications, they probably need to be exercising in an exercise clinic or a hospital, possibly a fitness centre, and they need to be under the supervision of an AEP or an AEP with oncology training. It just depends on uh, evaluating the risk and then adjusting the patient, uh, adjusting the setting and the supervision to suit the individual patient and managing that risk. So let's turn our attention to an increasingly uh, 
needed, I guess, uh, an implemented aspect of exercise medicine, and that's actually using telehealth. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has really driven this because uh, many countries around the world uh, had social distancing requirements and uh, self-isolation. And uh, this meant that uh, patients could not attend exercise clinics. And the same occurred in, in our side at Perth, Western Australia. And uh, we have dozens of uh, different exercise programs and, and clinics that we operate. Uh, we have many uh, research trials as well. And we had to very quickly pivot to home-based programs, uh, continuing to exercise our patients in their own home. And whilst this was an enormous challenge, we certainly learned a lot. But also it's driven a lot of innovation change uh, within the various tools which are available for telehealth, which is, you know, let's look at it as a, 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 at least one uh, good outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the issue we face though is that we know from our own research and that of others that home-based programs are relatively unsuccessful. There's just not the same motivation and certainly adherence and retention is lower, but also the uh, the fidelity is lower and therefore the efficacy, the effect of the exercise is less. Uh, you just simply can't increase uh, fitness and, and health and strength and improve body composition to the same degree in a home-based program as you can in an exercise clinic where it's supervised with other patients around you and you're using uh, the you know uh, proper exercise equipment. So... This creates a problem because access remains a major barrier for people to attend exercise classes, to come to exercise medicine clinics and sessions. In particular, if they're in rural, regional, or remote areas, but even within our own city, uh, a city such as Perth, it's, these patients are generally older, you know, uh, and uh, it's difficult for them to travel even a few kilometres to come to an exercise clinic if, uh, if they're unwell or they're particularly um, frail or elderly. So is telehealth exercise medicine the answer? And can we apply it for assessment, prescription, and then even ongoing monitoring with these patients? So let's have a look at a few aspects of telehealth exercise medicine. Well, one of the first things we implemented when we had to pivot uh, to home-based exercise due to COVID-19 was that we introduced our patients to video chat. and. Uh, for many of them, we had to stick with plain old telephone, but uh, it's interesting, even with the uh, older patients that we have, many of them do have internet access and are relatively comfortable with using smart devices and computers. And so we were able to get them to use video chat where we could talk to them, the exercise physiologist could uh, uh, do consultations, prescribe and monitor their exercise program, check their exercise technique. We've even been experimenting with having group exercise sessions where several patients, uh, perhaps three to six, might be exercising with an exercise physiologist monitoring. And we're really trying to recreate that group exercise environment, that peer support that's so, so important to keep the patients uh, uh, in an exercise program in the long term. Now, exercise prescription, this has been available for a decade or more, and we use the Technogym My Wellness Cloud solution. So uh, this is a, a software, cloud-based software solution where we can design up tailored exercise prescriptions for the patient, and then they can access it through their smart device or through their computer. It's cross-platform. It works on Android, uh, iOS, so Apple, and it, well as well as uh, on web browsers through um, on your uh, laptop or desktop computer. Now, My Wellness also allows us to monitor any wearable tech they might have, such as uh, heart rate monitors and physical activity monitors. And it works with um, Apple Health and the I uh, Apple Watch, but also Garmin, uh, Fitbit, etc. And allows you to track their workouts and the actual exercise that they're doing. And they can see videos of the exercise. If they're unsure, they can check to see what they're supposed to do and they can record every single set exercise and repetition, uh, giving them motivation, but also allowing the exercise um, physiologist to monitor what they're doing. So that's been very, very helpful for us to transition and support uh, telehealth exercise medicine. 
Certainly, remote assessment's been a challenge for us. How do we actually assess and test a, a, a patient? And that's probably been the greatest uh, challenge that we've had. We've ha been able to overcome most hurdles with here. With this, we are now uh, certainly um, assessing body composition. It may only be through height, weight, BMI, and then some skin, uh, some um, uh, circumferences, hip and uh, hip and waist. Uh, but also we're moving towards looking at uh, some of the bioimpedance devices. They're relatively inexpensive and they can be shipped out to the patient and then returned, lent out to them. Uh, other biosensors, uh, blood pressure monitors are very inexpensive. In fact, a large proportion of our patients will already have an automated blood pressure monitor. Heart rate, of course, is now in it very inexpensive through um, you know, the Apple Watch, but there's also much uh, less expensive uh, devices as well. And in, uh, you can purchase for as little as $49 Australian a, uh, a watch which is relatively accurate for measuring uh, heart rate and physical activity. Of course, many of the watches now and devices will measure O2 saturation, and certainly the Apple Watch uh, 6 uh, includes this uh, as well. And that is all because uh, they're all Internet of Things, they're all uh, Internet connected. It is all drawn up into the cloud for the patient to access or for their uh, health or medical um, clinician to monitor as well. And this gives us access to their data, aggregating uh, through the cloud uh, all of the dis different data sources that we have, running analytics across it, and then visualization of that data. Uh, sorry, I forgot this one. We are pushing out a lot of patient reported outcome measures. We use these extensively. So these are questionnaires mainly uh, around uh, general health. So the SF36 is one we use to assess their quality of life. There's various cancer specific measures such as the, the uh, FACT-G, which is a, a functional assessment of cancer therapy general. But we have then uh, cancer specific questionnaires uh, for uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, etc. We push them out using Microsoft Forms, so the patient receives a, an email with a link they just click on, the form loads up in their browser, they complete the form and the data ends up straight back into our um, secure cloud-based uh, databases. And so this is really advancing quite quickly and we are able now to remotely assess our patients and monitor them using these techniques and, te and telehealth. Now I just want to finish off with uh, a very interesting study that uh, we've just launched at ECU and this is using accentuated uh, eccentric resistance training and uh, this is a study which we're conducting in collaboration with Technogym and we're using their bio circuit. Now the bio circuit is a series of exercise resistance and aerobic machines which are all electromechanical so they're if you like robots and they have electromechanical actuators that provide the resistance. And we can program in not only the, uh, the mode of, uh, of resistance, so it can be isokinetic, isotonic, um, um, it can be uh, isoinertial or viscous, a whole range of different modes, but also what we're particularly interested in, the fact that we can have an accentuated eccentric mode, so that the patient pushes out, does the concentric movement with perhaps 50 kilograms, but then the machine, the robot, then loads them up with 25% higher on the eccentric phase. We're looking at this because sarcopenia, uh, low muscle mass, and cachexia, low overall body mass, are major problems for people with cancer. And we're seeing this more and more. Uh, depending on the cancer type, it's around two-thirds of, uh, can of cancer patients will suffer from sarcopenia or cachexia. And so exercise, eccentric exercise requires less energy, but it drives equivalent muscle size and strength benefits. So that's why I'm particularly interested in this. In particular, these men have prostate cancer and they're receiving androgen deprivation therapy. And this means that they have no testosterone. And testosterone is a very important anabolic pathway. But interestingly, eccentric exercise uses different anabolic pathways and it's independent of testosterone and that's why we're looking at this in this particular study and we're, we're very excited about the potential for use of the bio circuit in particular this e, uh, uh, accentuated eccentric mode. 
So this has been a long webinar and I, I appreciate it, uh, all your attention and time. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I've enjoyed it and I, I certainly hope that you have and that you've got some important take-home points from here. I'd like to thank you again. I would like to thank the American College of Sports Medicine and Technogym for the opportunity. I provide my email address and our web address. If you have any questions, I'm perfectly happy for you to contact me directly. I also want to alert you to the fact that I am now actively recruiting PhD students to commence in 2021. And if you are interested in this, then I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, these are PhD research projects specifically in exercise medicine uh, for the management of cancer. Please feel free to contact me directly if you're interested. Thank you again. I greatly appreciate your time and attention. Thank you again for attending. And a special thank you to Professor Robert Newton and Technogym for supporting this webinar. As a final reminder, please complete the short survey and the 15-question self-test. Upon passing the self-test, you will receive your CEC certificate via email, and your CEC will automatically be added to your ACSM profile. This concludes the webinar.